Welcome. I'm so grateful to be here with you all today. I'm Michelle Wright, Associate Director of Jazz Arts at Manhattan School of Music. Before we dive into today's discussion, I would like to let students know that today's event is eligible for setting the stage credit through the Center for Music Entrepreneurship. Also, at the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A box that will be live. So please submit any questions that you have. And as time permits, we will answer as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the panel. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to sharing this time with you. Today's discussion, new ways of performing for today's artists is the fourth iteration in our newly launched MSM, MSM Perspective series. Our talk will center around innovative ideas and some best practices to use current technology to connect with audiences. Our faculty and guest artists come from a variety of musical perspectives and have used technology to further develop their own creative artistry as well as their students and within the current pandemic crisis and social distancing have found new ways to consider performance and creative adaptation to generate live events that lean into the limitations that are inherent to many of these digital performing platforms. The history of new technological advances in the music industry and beyond have always proven to be disruptive to what was perceived as the way of the world, but notwithstanding has oftentimes been marked with those who embrace new technology and those who don't. As we have all been thrust into a new paradigm due to the pandemic, our current reliance on technology to stay connected has spurred a frenzy of artistic activity and has generative effects that will once again shift the perceived way of the world and give access to more creative options toward the future of live music. Now I would like to introduce our panelists. Please tell us about yourself. Let's start with Theo Blackman. Sorry, uh, my name is Theo Blackman. I'm a vocalist and composer. I teach in the jazz department. I, I teach jazz voice at Manhattan School of Music. Um, I work on, between contemporary jazz, modern jazz, and contemporary music. I work with uh, composers, contemporary music composers who write uh, music for me. I work. I perform my own music. I also collaborate with actually two people have collaborated with two people here on this panel, Dan Tepfer and Todd Reynolds, both composers themselves. So I do a lot of uh, different kinds of music, but mostly working with jazz musicians and coming from a jazz perspective. Wonderful, thank you, Theo. Uh, Mike Perdue. Hey, I, uh, I'm with Jude Trexler. I'm the co-director of the, the percussion ensemble at, at MSM. And uh, my background as a performer is in uh, orchestral percussion and chamber music and other kinds of experimental percussion and music making. And uh, you may have seen me around MSM as your scheduling manager uh, at some point. I've had a, a variety of administrative jobs at MSM. And I've also worked in the tech seat in New York City at, at some completely non-music related uh, tech startups. Great, thank you. Todd Reynolds. Hello, uh, greetings to everybody. My name is Todd Reynolds. I teach here in the CPP department here at Manhattan School. I'm part of Bang on a Can. I usually refer to myself as a classical violinist gone horribly wrong. Uh, I like Theo and Dan uh, come from the classical uh, background in a in in a strong way, but but uh, edge toward the jazz and pop and and also uh, new music environments. I teach electronic music, uh, a class called Performing with Electronics at Manhattan School, and also just began my own uh, online academy called Amplify This, uh, which has a summer program just coming up, and um, basically basically I I, I look at. Uh, look at all kinds of performing, including this new paradigm, which we've had to dug into, which was kind of a little new for me as well, as I think it is for everybody. This is all part, part of our performance practice, as is uh, an expanded vocabulary and uh, community uh, activism. I, I kind of consider all of that as, uh, as part of 
what it means to be a creative powerhouse uh, as a musician these days. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you, Todd. Dan Tepfer. Hi, everybody. I, uh, yes, I'm unmuted. Um, my name is Dan Tepfer, and I'm a pianist, I'm a composer, and a, and a coder. Um, and I've done a lot of different things. I mean, I would definitely say that I come from jazz very much. Um, I grew up as an improviser, and I went to the New England Conservatory uh, for jazz piano. Um, but as I kind of went through my 20s and, and my 30s, I've, I've really branched out quite a bit uh, on the one hand uh, into playing more classical music and, and using classical music as an influence for my work. Uh, for instance, uh, doing this project, Goldberg Variations, Variations, where I play the Goldberg Variations by Bach and then improvise after each one. Um, and I've also branched, in, uh, branched out into computer programming, um, doing this project, Natural Machines, where I've written computer algorithms that improvise with me in real time and also generate a uh, visual representation of the music as it's happening. Um, so um, yeah, I still stay really close to my roots in jazz. It's super important to me uh, as the, the foundation of my identity, but I also love to use the tools that I've developed as a jazz musician um, to do pretty much anything else that excites me. Well, welcome, thank you. And last but not least, June Trexler. Um, I'm Jude. Uh, as Mike mentioned, we, we co-directed Percussion Ensemble at MSN together. Um, I'm a graduate from the CPP program, and uh, I'm a drummer, I'm a composer. I consider myself a professional weirdo. Um, and so all things electronic and experimental is something that's always interested me. Um, yeah, I, I like to make noise on things, I like to hit things, and I like to see what's next and what's new. So that's what brings us here. Wonderful, thank you. So the first question is for Jude and Mike. Um, when you decided to move forward with the MSM Percussion Ensemble performance back in April, what were some guiding principles that initiated your decision to present a live socially distanced performance and how your concept was developed to lean into the technological limitations? Uh, Mike, if I can jump in, I, I, I said this to the panel as we talked about this lecture, but really it's, it's what I call like the Disneyland concept. You know, if, if we're driving to Disneyland and we're five minutes away and we find out that it's closed, listen, we've been driving a long time. I am going to drive to the parking lot of Disneyland before we turn around to go home. I, I know they're closed. Um, and I think a lot of that guided, you know, our decision to keep the performance. I mean, April 6th was really early in terms of what we now know is this long pandemic. Um, and a big part of it was, you know, we were probably four to five weeks out when everything went down and decided, you know, we're so close to the end of this. We've been preparing for months with our repertoire. Um, and we changed our repertoire entirely to fit what this now is and these, these, these Zoom concerts. But um, a big part of that decision was we're so close. Let's just, let's keep the concert date. Let's keep the kids motivated. Let's keep the, the momentum of, we're almost to the parking lot, guys. I mean, they're gonna be closed. It's not going to be what we planned, but like we're, we're driving to the parking lot if it kills us and then we're going to drive home. Um, but a big part of it was we had the date and it wasn't that far off. And we thought, let's let's salvage this just to keep that bit of normalcy, at least considering we've had this date. We had the the, the feeling of April 6th is the end of our semester with these kids. Um, and, and we're really fortunate that they were great, adaptable players that they they allowed us to sort of do the science experiment with them, which has now become a big part of the norm of performance. Right. We were, we were salvaging a performance day, but we were also, we knew we were entering into new territory and, and we were excited about what we would find. Uh, we, we repurposed some, some music that existed. There was a piece by John Cage. Jude had a piece. I wrote a couple of pieces and the common thread between all of these, these pieces of music was here we are live from 17 different locations. How do we play together? And the easy, immediate answer was, you don't. Uh, we chose this music because it still worked artistically, uh, knowing that we would never be able to line up downbeats together. Uh, the Cage number pieces, which were, were pieces from late in John Cage's life, uh, were an immediate starting point. And then the other music we chose uh, branched off from there. 
we rehearsed this, by the way. This wasn't just something we did on April 6th. We, we tried other pieces of music um, that may or may not have, have been successful. We improvised together and we wanted to, to still adhere to the things we already do in percussion ensemble, which is the chamber music credit for percussion majors at MSM, uh, which is good sound production um, on all of your instruments, even though now we're dealing with microphones and a very different acoustic landscape. Uh, preparation, you still had to practice your music. Um, good instrument selection, that's a thing in percussion, you know, if it, if it says symbol, there's a lot more to it than just grabbing any symbol. And uh, playing, playing together, but not in the, the traditional sense. Uh, it was still, I think, a, a fulfillment of our educational requirements. So the guiding principles were still the same in a lot of ways, but uh, we knew that we were working with a whole new set of, of, uh, of rules. Great. So basically creative ad adaptation and the creative process are essential elements to making this type of event interesting and successful. I wanna turn it now to Todd, Theo and Dan. Can you speak about your use of software to limit the technological limitations and some of the best practices that have helped you present live performances through streaming? And one other part of this question, can you speak about some of your current projects? Can we start with Todd? Yes, of course. Um, thank you. Let's see. Um, I'll, I'll say first, I mean, rather than, almost rather than, than talk about myself um, and my projects, I kind of like to call attention to what our students have done. Uh, in CPP, we, we concentrate a lot on, on learning digital audio workstations like Ableton Live and Reaper and, and uh, programming languages like, like uh, Max MSP. And so we have like 14, four, between, you know, 14 and whatever amount of students in our program. And just to call forth, uh, you know, one person, for instance, um, uh, Tyler Niedermeyer, bass clarinetist, who's been, uh, who's been kind of, who's been our studio assistant the last year while we were still, while we still had a room. Um, Tyler and a lot of the members of CPP have created Infrasound, which is a way of uh, kind of doing what, what Jude and, uh, and Mike were, were talking about. They have a whole band based around, you know, performing on the internet uh, and have adapted in that way. Uh, and, and also another uh, trio called Apply Triangle uh, with two other CPP members as well, Josh and Ji So uh, it's kind of, a, it's an interesting, interesting thing that, you know, having a base of technology awareness, having some sort of fluency in technology brings us to a place when something like this happens where we can adapt quickly. Uh, I myself was left with, with a new scenario. Uh, actually, Dan, Dan Tepfer is one of my inspirations who I didn't find until after I had started streaming. And uh, it turns out that we would often go live at the same time. So then after I would finish, I would rush over and see what he was up to. And of course, and, and I, I kind of incorrectly um, characterized Dan as coming from the classical world. And I'll tell you why. Because the other day on one of his streams, I caught him playing Jörg Ligeti's uh, piece kind of in the most incredible fashion and in more of a spirit than most classical new musicians would ever play it. It was kind of, it was unreal and off the chain. So, so all these things kind of, all these issues kind of bleed together. Right now, uh, at the very beginning of, of when we kind of went indoors, uh, I of course took on teaching our remaining classes uh, online. I hope our students were satisfied with, with how we got through that. I did find that every single one of our CPP students took on, the, took on the task and kind of executed brilliantly from wherever they were in the world, even some of them having gone to Denmark and uh, China. And so, uh, so really, I've dug down into streaming as the possibility for connection with people. That's been my way of doing it. I, I do a stream every Monday, Thursday, and Saturday when I can. I don't, I don't make it like rock solid. And, and my, my father-in-law was just catching me on the fact that I don't plan well enough for it. Um, sometimes I don't do something terribly new every time. But I do use it as, a, as a, an occasion to reach out. 
And, uh, and in reaching out, I find that I'm, I'm able to feel and I hope contribute a sense of, um, of community. Of course, Bang on a Can has also taken, taken on the, uh, the task of, of creating our usual marathons, kind of almost monthly. And they've been paying composers and paying the musicians to perform and to write. And very unlike the normal way of doing things where we just kind of do a performance and then leave it online so somebody can see at any time, these things are kind of restricted uh, to the performance days. So I've been engaged in a, a number of different ways of approaching performance. Another collaboration called Lean On Me, which was opera and uh, gauged toward first responders. There has been so much, just so much uh, creativity. A lot of things out of Houston uh, that I've been aware of that uh, through my friend Lynn Lane, who has a band down there and knows every artist down there. So uh, my own projects have mainly focused on trying to start up a summer program and hopefully start out some sort of online uh, academy where I can hopefully be a contribution to folks in the same way um, that I that I am uh, at Manhattan, but but through kind of much longer mentoring uh, mentoring um, opportunities for people. So it's kind of it's kind of digging down into the camera uh, where I hadn't before. I'd watched people create YouTube content forever, and I never thought I could. And uh, there's so many different ways now uh, when you dig down just a little bit. There's so many ways to be with people and, uh, and create performances that's uh, just been seriously rewarding. I don't think really I have any, I think I've taken up enough time. I'd rather hear from Dan and Theo, so I'd love to pass it over to them. Okay, let's pass it over. Thank you so much, Todd. Let's pass it over to Theo. Yes. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not even close to the technological know-how that Dan and, and Todd have as far as as streaming capabilities and and the computer language and coding and all that um what i have been doing mostly for myself i'm not not just talking of you know since the quarantine and we can talk about the class that i've been teaching if if you want in a different in a different moment but um is to either collaborate with people online through recording or I've been uh, also doing uh, these little miniature videos in my home during the uh, quarantine, during the uh, stay-at-home uh, time, and sort of finding ways um, that are not necessarily technological, but creatively working with the format of being at home and recording something uh, with video and audio that pertains to your own music and your own space. I've been writing a lot and I've also been uh, collaborating with people overseas. Um, so there's uh, a lot of recording and, and sending files back and forth that's been happening uh, in the last couple of months. And I've been writing. I've I received a commission to um, write so I've been composing. So it's a little bit more internal. I'm not doing a podcast. I'm not doing a vlog. I am not uh, reaching out in that way yet. Um, I'm sort of, my process is a little bit more internal right now. Great. For myself. You. Yeah. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dan. And I know that you two have collaborated across um, some platforms. And maybe Dan will speak a little bit about that. But I'm going to turn it over to him. Yeah. Um... So um, let's see, the, the lockdown hit uh, March 15th or so. Um, and like, like many of us here, um, I had a pretty busy touring schedule and all my gigs were canceled. And um, I think I had kind of like a, a little bit of a panic reaction. Um, not, not, I mean, I wasn't actually panicked, but uh, the thing that was like immediately zipping through my brain is what can I do with this new reality and it seemed very urgent somehow at the time um now we're all used to it so it feels very different but uh but right at that moment what occurred to me is that um i had a project called bach upside down it's like hashtag bach upside down and um i it, it's a project where i play pieces by bach and then i've written this program for my computer that immediately does a chromatic inversion of it uh in other words plays it upside down, uh, not backward, backwards, but upside down. And, and it 
works unbelievably well, the, the music of Bach, because it's so well constructed, and Counterpoint works really beautifully upside down, almost as well as upside down, as, as uh, the, the, the right side up. Um, and, uh, and so I realized I suddenly have a bunch of free time, and so I could do that project uh, seriously. And so I started doing uh, one of the Goldberg variations every day, um, and went um, all through the first half of the Goldbergs, uh, and just was posting them on YouTube. And actually, by the time I got to the halfway point, um, the New York Times wrote a piece about that, which was pretty cool, because it's one of those examples where um, you do something just uh, because you think it's cool. Like, I, I didn't really think <laughs> people would be that interested in it because it's, very, it's a very kind of nerdy thing. Uh, but then it turns out when the piece came out, uh, it actually crashed my website because uh, so many people were checking it out. So, um, so that's one thing that came out of the, out of the pandemic. And then um, probably, I think it was late March, um, a presenter in Europe reached out to me. Um, he was organizing an online festival and invited me to live stream uh, as part of the festival. He had, he had a whole bunch of, of, of musicians doing live streams and, and they were just kind of going from one to the other. And I'd never done anything like that before. But, um, you know, I try to say yes to things when they, especially when they scare me a little bit. Uh, and so I said yes, and I did this live stream, and there were like, you know, 120 people checking in live, and ultimately, like some, you know, something like five or 6,000 views. And I just had an amazing time. Um, I think a lot of musicians can relate to uh, live performance being a fundamental um, portion of their happiness of their happiness like I know I need a certain amount of live performance in my life for for myself to feel good psychically and um, and what I realized is that doing those live streams um, gave me that feeling it was truly like that feeling of danger and immediacy uh, I was able to really have that when I was doing the live stream so so when that first one happened I just decided okay I, I gotta keep doing this I'll do it every week and so I've been live streaming every Monday at 2 p.m. from my place, and I've gotten my, my um, live stream set up looking pretty good. Actually, I'll say a few words about how that happened. Um, uh, another thing that happened with the pandemic is that a few of the presenters uh, who had hired me decided to, who had hired me before the pandemic to do concerts, decided to still keep my concert, um, but have me do it live and still pay me. Uh, which is a godsend because they don't have to do that and I very much appreciated that and one of them a presenter in Austria um, Had somebody um, reach out to me from Austrian TV and This guy was like look Dan um, your sound is really great because I've been recording all my own records since 2011 So I'm, I'm pretty good at sound. It's like your sound is really great. The music's great uh, The image is good because I, I learned how to do images for my natural machines project uh, so I I have some good cameras at home, uh, but he said, uh, your lighting sucks. Uh, so he walked me through uh, doing lighting, which turns out is like a very important thing. I see Todd Reynolds uh, has uh, pretty good lighting here today. <laughs> uh, so, so I got my lighting together and then um, I've gradually learned how to do other things like uh, superimpose my real time graphics over the image. Um, in, in a transparent way, which uh, I don't know if we have time for this, but I can show examples of, of some of this. Um, and the other thing that I've been getting into, last thing, sorry this is going on so long, is this thing called Jack Trip, uh, which is a piece of software that's open source um, that was written by uh, Chris Chafee and, and um, another person whose name I'm forgetting right now. Uh, and the goal of, of Jack Trip is to facilitate super low latency um, musical interaction over the internet. And what, that, what, what that's allowed me to do is to do uh, actual real-time duets with people uh, who live nearby. It has to be within like a, a radius of 100 miles or so, um, where we're actually playing in rhythm, um, really playing together. Uh, so this is something I've done with Theo Blackman. I've done it with uh, Linda Mehan O. Oh, I've done it with uh, Clarence Penn. Um, I've done it with Dana Stevens, with uh, Melissa Aldana, with Jorge Roder, uh, with Orr Barricade, um, and I'm going to do a two piano concert with Aaron Deal in a couple weeks.
Uh, and that's been really extraordinary because uh, in addition to reclaiming that feeling of live performance by doing these live streams, this has given me the feeling of really playing with another human being, which is, uh, you know, and really improvising in real time. Um, and that's really been, been very precious. And, and I'm, the last thing I want to say is that those streams where I've collaborated with other people um, in the last month, I've made those paid live streams. So I actually sell tickets to those uh, and um, people buy tickets and we make money and we do a honest to God live concert for people. We take requests in the comments um, and I'm very proud and excited about that model where we're actually doing real live concerts uh, for people who are buying tickets uh, in this strange situation. Thank you, Dan. It's wonderful. Um, is there an opportunity for you to share what you and, and Theo have been working on? Do you have a, a clip that you'd like to share with us? I do, yeah. Um, I actually <laughs> went to my Facebook page uh, a few minutes ago. So, so this, is, um, this is my eighth live stream, and Theo was my guest. And um, I think, uh, let's see. So I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just play it and we can talk about it afterwards. Um, okay, I'm sharing the screen. Here we go. And now I'm hitting play. Here we go. I'm not seeing anything. There's no screen share for us. Oh. Aha, okay. Hold on a second. There we go. Is that working? Yep, there we go. Okay, there we go. I don't think we have sound. Yeah, no sound yet, Dan. Are oh, you not getting sound? Right, no sound. Nope. Okay. That's okay. the little checkbox on the bottom left. Okay, there we go. Share the screen. Share computer sound. Yes. Okay. There you go. Much, I'm much more proficient with OBS than I am with Zoom. <laughs> I should probably only play an, ex an excerpt, right? Right. Thank you so much. That was really yeah. wonderful. 
So can you talk us a little bit through this process? It's really, really wonderful. You're hearing each other at the same time. What, what, are, you, what are you guys doing? Uh, yeah, so, so the one problem with Jack Trip is that it was written by academics uh, to be used kind of in an academic environment by people who are really proficient with computers. Uh, so it's not super user friendly. So uh, fortunately, just because I've been doing programming my whole life and, and, and uh, been interested in computers, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that environment. Um, and so what I've done is kind of, by, by doing it with a bunch of people now, I've worked out a way to get my duet partners um, set up with Jack Trip relatively quickly. And by relatively quickly, I mean like minimum one hour, probably more like two hours uh, to, to get it to get it really right. Um, Can and, I just uh, yeah. jump in here for a second? So uh, it took overall for us to set it up uh, five hours. Mm. We had three rehearsals and you know the setup itself was back and forth just to try mm -hmm. to try out different things and different you know type in different uh, numbers and, and letters into terminal in my Mac that you know Dan dictated to me and Sometimes you sacrifice sound quality for latency back and forth and you try this, is, is this better, is that better? That's, that's, that takes skill, you know, know-how, and it also takes time. But eventually we got something. And the thing I, th I think that kind of, was kind of tricky, it wasn't completely uh, repeatable. So the, the, the connection is different from one day to the next. Am I correct, Dan? Yeah, it's, it's interesting where, you know, when you do this, yeah. you're truly stretching the possibilities of the internet. And when you're stretching the possibilities of the internet, uh, you realize that they keep changing. Uh, for example, when I did my live stream with Miguel Zanon, I didn't mention earlier, I did, I did a concert with Miguel Zanon as well, a great uh, saxophonist. Uh, we set up on a Sunday, and, we were, and he's up in, uh, near the Cloisters in, in far northern Manhattan, uh, and I'm in Brooklyn. So we're, you know, we're a solid 20 miles from each other. We set up on a Sunday and got this really great low latency connection. And then the concert was on a Thursday in the middle of the day, like at 3 p.m. on a Thursday. And you know we set up an hour before the stream and I realized the network conditions were just really different. And so we had to choose different settings because uh, you, you, know, you want to push it as far as you can, but then you, you, you can't push it farther than that because you don't want the sound to fall apart while you're doing your concert. Um, so yeah, that's that's a pretty interesting thing. Learning about the 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 uh, intricacies of, <laughs> of networks and and network traffic. Um, Michelle, would it make sense for me to answer a couple of the questions that I see have come up in the Q and A? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, we're we're gonna have a Q and A at the end. But one question that I do see is um, how to get the Jack Trip software. Like, I think people are curious about how do you acquire software, and you're a coder, so. Um, you know, you're doing some extra things to enhance the product, but what about someone who doesn't have those skills? Yeah, well, what I would say um, is that I encourage everyone, even if you don't think you have the skills, to check it out because um, I'm actually going to bring up a link right now. Um, so the, the person that I uh, was introduced to, to this by is uh, Michael Dessen, uh, who's a great trombonist uh, and improviser. And um, I actually wasn't introduced to it by him personally. I just uh, was looking this up and, uh, excuse me, and happened upon uh, his videos on YouTube where he explains it. And he explains it really well. He's gone way out of his way to uh, write these tutorials. Um, I'm going to put a link in, where should I put this? In, I guess I can answer one of the questions. Yeah, here we go. Uh, here, here we go. I'll answer Elaine Bear's question. Um, so that, what I just posted, is a uh, link to one of to Michael Dessen's first video, uh, explaining how to use Jack Trip and how to set it up. You should also check out um, in the description of the video. There's a bunch of links um, to, to 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 the places where you can download it. Um, so yeah, I would encourage everyone to, to try it out because it's it's challenging, but um, but not that not that challenging. It just depends. You just have to try it. Uh, you know, you might you might be surprised, and, and you might be able to set it up, get it working pretty quickly. Um, so regarding setting it up, I know you and Todd last week had a conversation about it, and Todd was very curious 
um, to set it up. And, and Todd, can you jump in a little bit and, and give us uh, a synopsis of how you got it started? <laughs> Oh, sure. I, I mean, I, I actually haven't gotten it started. I, I reached out to Dan and said, hey, I, you know, I would I would love to do this with you and see how it works. And, uh, it's he's so very, <laughs> he's very diplomatic when he uh, when he speaks about the user interface of that trip. It looks like something from the 80s or 90s. That, that, that used to, that Todd, your sound is, is getting really low and broken up oh and broken up how about now is that it's better good now okay that was weird that was very weird um uh, what i was going to say is that i uh i have up till now run that. i have heard from michael Desson as well and um and i hadn't seen it work i just seen it work here for the first time actually with with dan and theo in the um in the uh video that that dan shared so um so I had run from it. So I reached out to Dan and said, hey, let's do this. And Dan said, okay, yeah, when I have time, let's do this. So, uh, so hopefully we will have a chance to, uh, to do that. Um, Michelle, I've got a couple of other answers to questions. If you'd like to hear them now or else we can go later. I can make this pretty quick. I'm sure. What did you want to say, Todd? To, uh, there was a question, Dan, from, from uh, Dee Dee Jackson about, about what they counseled you on lighting. And uh, Dee Dee Jackson, I will put your, I will put a video in there for you, which kind of changed my world with, with lighting. It's the way that I, that I look the way I look. It was just, it was one guy who made a YouTube video that said, hey, this is why I look like this. I started looking like that. And it's a kind of a wonderful email. I'll just copy that and, and, uh, and put it as an answer to your question. Is, is, it the, is it the how to make a $300 camera look pro video? It would indeed be how to make a three hundred dollar camera look. Broke. That was the same one that I was going to post, and that's the one that the that the Austrian uh, TV producer pointed me to. It's really excellent. Great. It, it is. It is. Real. There it is. Yeah, I'll um, I'll uh, post that as an answer to you. There was that. There, oh, stop it, please. Um, there was uh, also a question about audio interfaces. I think maybe if you want to hold it to the end, but but uh, but I think people have some questions about audio interfaces, which are kind of easily answered uh, by us. Do um, you want to take a crack at that one, Dan, or you want me to do that just real quick? Uh, well, you know what? I think I think audio interfaces. I, I just want to uh, answer a few questions about Jack Trip because they'll just take a second. Uh, Wendy Talio asks, "Can anyone get this software? Is it expensive?" Um, it is free. Uh, Jacktrip, uh, Jacktrip is open source and free. So I, you know, I, I, I recommend anyone um, check it out uh, in the link that I posted. Uh, and uh, Austin Jang asks, uh, is latency 10 is latency 10 milliseconds or less possible with standard residential internet using Jacktrip? Uh, 10 milliseconds is really pushing it. Uh, you could achieve 10 milliseconds if you created a local network with someone like in your building, for example, no problem. Uh, but with standard residential internet, you're more in the 20 milliseconds to 30 milliseconds range, uh, which is equivalent to playing with someone who is like 20 feet or 30 feet away from you in a room. Uh, so it, it, it requires a little bit of adapting. Um, you can just feel, it's like you can't quite place uh, what the delay is, but there's some kind of, it's not like playing with somebody who's right next to you, it's like playing with somebody who's 20 or 30 feet away. Great. Um, like to have the audio interface thing really quickly, Michelle, or do you need no, to move on? No, no, please do. Okay. Um, for everybody who thinks about audio interfaces, let me just give a real quick explanation. Your laptop, as it stands, of course, has an audio interface right now. It's what your headphones plug into. It's what your internal mic addresses. And it's quite small and quite inefficient. That's why if you're trying to do any sort of high level audio, you want to move to an audio interface. They can be all sizes from this size to this size to a whole rack space size. They can go anywhere from $100 or less to $2,000 to $3,000, depending upon what you want. The holy grail for you is to get what we call, and, and Dan has used this word a lot, so let me explain it. It's latency. It's the lowest latency possible. You'll notice when you use Zoom, you'll notice even with a telephone or with Skype, you'll notice that you talk and it's like people take a long time to hear you. And there are actual numbers, you know, a thousand milliseconds is a full second. 
if you can pull latency down to 12 milliseconds, it's almost as if you are just like in real time. And that's kind of, that's the holy grail of what Dan is going for when he says he's pushing Jack Trip. All of these audio interfaces allow you to pull that latency down. So even if you get a $200 Focusrite Scarlet two input, two output interface, which goes into a USB port, you are very, very far ahead of the game from where you were yesterday. And from that point on, using that brand, Focusrite, Scarlet, you can go up to $500 and have a whole studio's worth of inputs and outputs. So there are a lot of ways to travel. Um, if anybody really has specific questions, um, uh, happy to answer them later or else you can, you can seek me out in some other way or come take our class. Uh, but uh, but that's, that's just what I wanted to share. Hopefully that'll send you down a rabbit hole, which will be beneficial for you. Thank you, Michelle. Great. Thank you, Todd. So just going back to this um, leaning into the glitch, which Jude and Mike um, talked about a little bit earlier. Can you talk about when you were ta uh, composing your pieces, how you approached composition to, um, to really lean into, as you guys called the glitch? Could you talk about that a little bit? Jude had a piece that, that actually existed before uh, this concert existed. Would you, would you talk about uh, an homage to sleep? Um, I, I had a piece I wrote in 2006 um, that was really about taking sounds that you hear and manipulating them. Um, I call it like the Tai Chi of, of John Cage sound music. Um, and it's just four sentences. I, I think the first is, don't make a sound until a sound is made. Um, imitate that sound exactly. Imitate another sound and then imitate a sound being imitated. Um, and the idea from that was, you know, there, there's so much background noise, there's so much glitch, there's so much dropout. Um, and these Zoom calls, I mean, even, even you know, Todd's got a better rig than anybody I know. And there are moments when the internet just crumbles for a moment. We can't expect it or explain it. Um, and so that's the piece we opened the concert with. And that really, I think, set our, our, our vision for what you have is perfect. I mean, yes, get an interface. Yes, the Jack Trip sounds incredible. And it's, it's, I'm texting Mike back and forth in this conversation. Like, we got to do this this weekend, man. We got to play on Jack Trip. Um, <laughs> But a big thing, a big tenet that Mike and I wanted to push was what you have is, is fine, let's, let's use that. It's not the best, um, but a big proponent of John Cage's music and, and my music by extension is take what you're given and, and manipulate in a way that is clever and, and fun, uh, in my opinion. Um, and so the piece really was, you know, we have 14 kids in our 14, 15? We have 15 performers plus you and me. Yeah. So we had 17 people on the screen performing um, and so we open the concert with, you know, like any of these Zoom calls, there's a holding screen and then we all sort of show up. Um, and the idea was wait until something happens. Um, and I don't remember the concert so much, but I know in one of our dress rehearsals, uh, there was like a dog barking in somebody's background. And so that became, you know, and then that sound became manipulated depending on the instruments you had. Um, and so a lot of it really was, you know, with 15 students from literally all over the world, we, we didn't know what they were going to have. We didn't know what kind of technology they were going to have. And with four or five weeks out, we didn't really expect them to, to be able to get a hold of some gear, especially at the height of, of at least in New York with the pandemic. Um, so a big part of that was, was sort of, again, manipulating the sounds that you've received. If it's a dog barking, if it's the glitch of a dog barking, if it's a weird dropout of, of Mike's triangles behind him. Um, and the idea became, how can you manipulate the sounds that have been created by this internet webcast? Um, and that's something that our students are familiar with. That's something that, that again, as a, as a personal student of John Cage, at least in my own mind, um, that's something that we had been teaching for the last three or four years about good improvisation is not, I really want to use this sound. It's what just happened and how do I manipulate that? How do I, how do I cleverly take that sound? And again, the fourth line of, of my piece is imitate a sound being imitated. How do you imitate the sound of not a dog barking, but of this Pandero? And how do I find a way to make that an imitation of an imitation, like a bad copy of a bad copy? Um, so one thing that, that Mike and I really wanted to push was you have all the instruments, you have what you need 
And it might be something along the lines of, you know, uh, one of the questions Elaine asked was, what music worked best? What were some of the qualities of the music that, that worked best for your show? And it really, it was what we call music of coexistence, what Stuart Saunders Smith calls music of coexistence. I mean, whether it's stopwatch music by John Cage, whether it's, again, manipulating sounds as you receive them. The best part of it, I think, was that we expected some weird glitch moment to start the sound. I mean, half the time in our rehearsals, it was because <laughs> the air conditioner would all of a sudden take over the microphone feed. Our, our, again, our, our kids were novices at this, so they would, kids, the, the young adults were fortunate to teach, but they would, they would not have their microphone settings right. And so it, it, it created a lot of what Michelle called like leaning into the glitch um, it, it created and sort of sparked these, these really otherworldly sounds of, of, again, of your internet dropping out. One of my favorite sounds in the world is the sound of a modem dialing up. Um, old as that is now, like that's one of my favorite sounds in the world is that like... <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I wrote this piece in 2006, but I felt like it was, it was finally really ready for the masses here in, in April of 2020. Um, but that, that was a big thing, you know, guiding our, our concert repertoire was, you know, what really works in this setting that you, you don't need to play together? Because let's be honest, and Mike and I have said this a lot in these panel discussions, but you can't play together. Not on Zoom. I mean, Jack Tripp is incredible, and, and I've never heard of something with so little latency, especially across the, the, the globe here. But, like, you cannot go back to the normal, at least right now. And I, Mike and I just thought, like, we're not tech gurus. I love electronics. I love technology. I'm, I'm enamored by it. But no, like it's not a thing that I that I know anything, you know, close to these other guys on the panel talking about, you know, tech and, and packets and latency and all this stuff. Like I just like listen. I got my laptop. I got a few nice microphones. Uh, what if we toss the microphone on the ground? That would be cool, right? <laughs> I yeah. I I think that that is an interesting point because not everybody in my class had the technology or had the uh, you know the know how how to even uh, record something into their computer, um, and so I kind of feel like I'm in between Dan and Todd and and Jude and Mike uh, in where I used my the technology I had, which is the recording technology in Logic and the video, um, the video capabilities on an iPhone. And maybe if I can quickly, like maybe for two minutes, share the little videos that I've made as a commission from the Jazz Gallery um, that use sort of my quirky sensibility and a visual sensibility to create some uh, music musical content um, because it what it what I want to highlight here is that we have to focus not only on the technology, but also on the creative aspect of, the, of what we all have as, as artists. So maybe I can just uh, quickly show you a few. We lost your sound, uh, Theo. Yeah, let me just make sure I'm sharing the sound as well. No. If you if you remain muted, uh, Theo, if you actually remain muted while you share your sound, then it won't share. I don't think. You're muted. That. Okay. Let me undo that. Let's see that there is no little extra box on the bottom. Oh yes, share computer sound. Okay. So hold on. There we go. So I used my can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I used my stairwell in my building uh to create a piece where I sing and walk up the stairs. What's happening? What's happening? Ah. Did I 
Did I lose you? Did I lose you all? It's, it's, it seems to be working fine, Theo. Okay. Okay. Theo, would you like to talk us through your creative process when you were creating these videos? Yeah, so, um, sorry, I lost the screen. <laughs> Ironic in a technological... Uh, <laughs> so, um, the creative process was to use the elements that I have, which is my building, my apartment, and my voice, and a piano. Um, so that was one of the pieces that is normally a solo piece but I used the environment and uh, just an iPhone that I held over the you know railing or attached over the railing. For the next piece, that is a piece that I use percussion at, and I used my oven as the as the table. Um, Great. Thank you, Theo. Um, also, regarding uh, creative collaborations. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know that from the artistic side, your personal artistry, and as an educator, what are some of the creative collaborations that you have implemented in your curriculum for your students during our remote learning process? Yes, so let me uh, stop sharing this. Uh, so back here we are screen so what we did at the beginning of the semester um you know was is the normal class with my with my jazz vocalists is for them to bring in material and for a jazz trio and a uh, plus a guitarist to play their material in preparation for the monthly 55 bar jazz gig that we have and it really centers around the singer the vocalist uh, getting their repertoire together, making their arrangements really great, and having them sing really well as a solo singer performer. Now, with this, obviously uh, March 13th or whenever it happened, we couldn't we couldn't be in the same room anymore. So, what Joe Laurie, my co-teacher, and I realized is that there are so many other things that we can teach the students that we don't get to teach during the normal course of the semester. And one of those skills, or many of those skills, are in background singing, collaborating, singing other people's music, and, and recording it, and sending it back and forth, and negotiating that, um, layering. So we started to pair up the instrumentalists with students in di for different uh, assignments to uh, be sometimes a hired hand, sometimes a... a not even a, a vocalist, more of a soundscape, and um, have them do things that they normally wouldn't do and collaborate in a way that also brought the instrumentalists to the foreground. Because usually in the, in the combo, the instrumentalists are there to serve the singer mostly. Of course, they're playing solos and, and we're working on their playing as well, but it really centers around the singers because of the performance that we have. So here, the uh, instrumentalists became composers that had to hire or hired um, our singers. And suddenly the singers had to fulfill something that actually is much closer to the reality of where they're going to be when they leave the school. Not all of our singers are going to be the next Jasmia Horn or Cecile McLaurin Salvant. Um, so there's many, many other ways that we can, as jazz singers, uh, be a voice in somebody else's music or in collaboration with instrumentalists. And we suddenly saw instrumentalists come out of their shell because we had never even seen them uh, bring to the table what they were putting forth in these collaborations. So it was really, really interesting. And it was uh, musically actually sometimes more interesting than <laughs> what happened in class so this this collaborative aspect is what we're going to keep we're going to keep that in the class uh going forward whether we're in the same room or not great thank you so i, I want to circle back a little bit um you know because we were talking about the glitch and i know that um 
Mike had done some work, um, visual work that he wanted to talk a little bit about and kind of go back to that. Yeah, I just typed something in the chat and I'll say it briefly. We, we have worked on graphic notation as a matter of, of course in percussion ensemble for the last three years. We at least once a year do a graphic score, whether we create it or we take something sort of from the 20th century uh, canon of graphic scores like Earl Brown. Uh, so I made a new score. Uh, the idea again was that we were not gonna play together. That's okay. Um, some other ideas around that were there were 17 of us, but I didn't exactly assign who plays what, what little picture on the graphic score. There's a little squiggle over here and there's a, a picture of a thing over here. We, we kind of left it up to chance. Um, that forces everyone to listen. It also uh, created some pretty beautifully chaotic moments where everyone was trying to play at the same time. And Zoom, like other conferencing software, is not built for music. Zoom's responsibility is to decide who is talking. Right? There's a yellow frame around my rectangle right now because it knows I'm talking. With 17 percussionists trying to play in succession, some <clears throat> resonant instruments, some dry, some loud, some soft, it couldn't decide. Uh, we let that be a feature instead of a bug. In fact, um, the MSM distance learning and recording arts team was sort of our, our AV crew during this, this concert. We enabled the Zoom uh, feature called uh, speaker view. We were in gallery view sometimes, we were in speaker view. So it was like the camera was switching to whoever, whoever it thought was playing. Um, we embraced that as a visual effect. I also wrote in some visual effects. There was moments where everyone took their cell phone flashlight and brought it up to the camera and that was notated in quasi rhythm. Um, so it was a little bit of a fireworks show uh, in addition to, to being this sort of crazy sonic experience. What one audience member heard in, in Alabama might have been different from another audience member in, in New York because Zoom is, I think, trying to figure out what to send to whom. I think everybody got kind of a different experience. And again, we, we wanted that to be part of this, this glitch performance. I, I also mentioned in the chat, uh, there was an encore piece called Windows. This was you know straight ahead, like treble clef, 4-4, four, four, A major, I conducted it. And we knew we would never actually play together. Uh, but that was okay. We, we engineered it that way. And uh, I'm, I'm, we, we didn't do any of these as an answer. That's sort of my main thesis around all of this. Is all of these were still questions. If this panel today is, is sort of a question about what, what are the new ways of performing, I think Jude and I have always had an approach to just ask more questions. Uh, and never, because we don't know, we, we want to see what the students come up with and what audience members who might be inspired by some of this come up with based on even our shortcomings around glitchy uh, video performance. And that's, that's what's most interesting to me at least. Um, I, I am very curious to see what, what happens next when the technology gets better. Right. Thank you, Mike. You know what I find really wonderful about the, the discussion today is that it sounds like each individual artist within this new paradigm can really create their own voice. They can really be artistically expressive and do things in ways that perhaps when uh, we were in the, the old normal, <laughs> whatever that means, um, that they couldn't do live on stage. And this opens up opportunities. I know we had this conversation last week as we prepared for this. And Todd said something interesting, which was basically this is going to really open up creative platforms for students or students and artists in a way that just has never been seen before. Todd, can you talk a little bit about what you foresee for the future? Sure. Um... You know, before this happened, um, I used to catch people practicing on Instagram, you know, <laughs> now, now I, now you start seeing famous people practicing on Instagram. So, uh, you know, I, I would agree, of course, with, with what you just characterized, there is this, um, kind of when I step back a little bit from this situation and from technology, and I ask myself, what is our purpose? as musicians? Are we the, the priests and, and priestesses who are, are meant to soothe the savage beasts who come and pay tickets to see us? That's not, that's not it. It never really has been it, I don't think. I think we're, we're more than that. 
I think what we are are vessels for building flexibility and resilience. Uh, I think whether you are preparing for your next Sibelius concerto performance with an orchestra that might happen in four years when everything returns to normal and you go down that natural progression, whether that's your, whether you are really like a tried and true dig down into classical history type of musician, or whether you're on the other spectrum and you're like, I'm an embrace the glitch person. There's no matter what, what I'm seeing in this panel, you know, Dan and I, we kind of have a penchant for technology. So we kind of lean that way. Whereas, whereas Jude and Mike have this kind of penchant for Cage and Pauline Oliveros and graphic notation and Earl Brown and all these incredibly inventive folks. And they kind of lean that way as this, and the, as this takes place. And then Theo in his house, I mean, I've known Theo for a very, very long time. And Theo in his work with Meredith Monk, all the, all the things he's done. If you take a look at Theo's body of work, there's inventiveness that goes way beyond music. It is about image, not necessarily just a camera, but about a way of seeing things, a way of being seen. So I think that what this opens up for each of us, whether you are engaged in trying to make jack trip work or whether you want to use acapella to make vocal choirs, whether you want to try to reproduce a combo or whether you want to take off and do something with a mover, with a dancer or with an actor, whether you want to become an actor yourself, whether you want to story tell, whether you want to recite poetry and make music to it, it doesn't matter. But what does matter, I think, is for we as musicians to look kind of deeper than we have before to, at this new possibility and say, what is it that I have to offer? And even more importantly than that, how do I show the world the flexibility and the heart and the encouragement and the power of being, being an artist, both for myself and on behalf of, of every human being, whether that's through community or activism or just through performance and inventiveness and creativeness. Thanks, Michelle. Beautiful, very well said, thank you. Can I turn it over to Theo? What, what trends do you think are for the future and what will stay um, as part of your repertoire? I can't say it better than that. I mean, that encompasses everything. Um, I think what each person has to find out is really what they're what they want to communicate and then how to use the medium at hand there's not only you know we all have other platforms as well uh, whether it's YouTube or uh, Twitter or whatever you want how to how to communicate and if you're if your automatic pilot of communication is shut off then you have to figure out another way and it really reflects back on you what do i actually want to say what is really the message and so that is a, a really it's actually a little bit of a blessing in some way that this is happening because it made me realize that one of the things that i absolutely crave is to play with other people um, when i played with dan the, for the first time together in real time, I was overcome. I was so emotional that I realized that that is why I'm in music. And that doesn't mean that I'm not going to do solo concerts. And I've done a solo record. I've done solo concerts for decades before this pandemic <laughs> because I wanted to play solo. But it, it, is a, it, it really brought to life a few things about why I'm making music. Um, and what I want to communicate. So I want to encourage all the students to, uh, to, from their bubble, to communicate the most intimate, the most, the closest thing that they feel uh, that they can bring out into the world uh, to us. Beautiful, thank you. Yeah. Jude, your turn. <laughs> um, you know, the thing that Mike and I have been saying on repeat, just, over the last few months has been, you know, this isn't normal. You can't, it's not a Band-Aid. You can't go back to, to playing, you know, whether it be with your choir, with your percussion group, with your rock band. Um, but I think what's most interesting to me is, is besides all this tech, which fascinates me, is what, what is this going to do when we opened up the doors and it's, it's safe again? You know, what, what about this tech is, is I've, got a, I've got a duo partner in, in Oakland, California. I mean, we don't get to play together that often. Like, I would love that 
you know, Jack Tripp, et cetera, builds to a point where I can uh, regularly play in a public setting with my bandmate, Ann Rainwater, in, in Oakland, California, and I'm here in, in, in Harlem. You know, and so I, I like to think that this isn't a Band-Aid, but as problem solvers, how do we take this tech, what we've learned here, you know, stuck in our homes in this pandemic, and how do I bring that back to the concert stage, or how do I, how do I evolve with this? I mean, Dan said it best, like, we go into panic mode when this happened, but it doesn't mean we're in panic. It means, you know, your brain goes into this, this frenzy of, like, how do I fix this? How do I fix this? Or, or, or for Mike and I, how do I manipulate this? to be something that is that is new and is fresh and is interesting because uh, the internet is full of garbage there's so much garbage on the internet and i like to think that what we're doing now diving into this in a deep deep intelligent way how is that going to make something even more grand and even more incredible and, and an evolved sense of live performance when when the band-aid is is not necessary when we can just we could go outside and, and do this together in person um, I have no idea what the answer is. Again, Mike and I like to pose more questions than answers just because it honestly feels easier. Um, but, you know, I'm excited. I don't know what the answer is. I, I'm excited. Great. Mike? Uh, I, Emily Dirks mentioned in, in the Q&A uh, a question about performing outside. That's, that's one of the things that I'm interested in, and it's such an obvious thing uh, if you're able to do it. Uh, we we haven't finalized our plans for the MSN percussion ensemble yet uh, this this fall, but things that are, I'm interested in uh, that Jude and I are discussing, outdoor performance is one of them. Um, there is music I think that is suitable for that. There is music to be composed for that. Um, so maybe you know the answer to Emily's question for me is really all about the compositions. Uh, Performing outside in a socially distanced way is, is an obvious solution. The question is what kind of music actually works for that. I, I believe some pieces do and some don't. Um, I, I'm glad to see everyone, no, no matter what genre of music they, they, they work in or what their familiarity has been with technology, people are doing a lot of recording. People are doing a lot of recording of parts and stitching them together. We've seen plenty of that since day one of lockdown. That's great. I want to see the evolution of that. Um, and then, as we've been discussing, live group performances, whether they have a lot of latency or they don't, or there's some other thing that we haven't even figured out yet. Uh, I hope to see that uh, mutate. Mutation can be a, a beneficial thing in this pandemic. Mike, if I can add to that, you know, Mike and I have been friends a very long time. One thing that Mike says that I'm, I'm always enamored with is never do nothing. Like doing nothing is not an answer. I mean, I've, I've seen every panelist nod their head. Like you can't do nothing. You can't give up. Like there's so many answers. They might not be the right answer, but like you got to sort through a thousand wrong answers to find that right answer. And, and even that right answer will be wrong out of context, but never do nothing. I mean, Mike says that all the time to me, like we can't do nothing. It's not an option. Great. So Dan, um, can you please uh, speak to us a little bit about um, your artistic journey um, with the current trends and what you think are going to be some of the really hot um, tech commodities uh, moving forward? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I wanted to say a couple things. Um, maybe before I forget, I just wanted to answer one question um, that was asked uh, by Austin Zhang. Uh, he says, question for Dan, love your musical visualizations. Could you elaborate on the learning curve in developing that? What, la what languages you used? Um, so uh, first of all, thank you, Austin. Uh, and, and yeah, as I mentioned earlier, I've been uh, writing programs that generate real-time visualizations of the music um, as it's happening in my Natural Machines project. And um, could, could I show just like a couple seconds of that? Um, do we have time for that? Sure. Okay, uh, this will just, just a couple seconds. Um, let's see, uh, here we go.
okay, so so I, I want to keep that uh, I want to keep that brief, uh, but oh, thank you. Um, but uh, I just just wanted to show a couple of seconds so people know uh, what we're talking about here. So in my natural machines project, which if people are interested in uh, is on YouTube, you can just look up Dan Tepfer for natural machines and find the playlist for the 11 tracks. I've written these uh, visualizations and uh, I've written the visualizations in a programming environment called processing. And actually for anyone, I, I feel like this is probably a, a, as good a time as any uh, to get into programming for anyone who's into who, who's interested. And processing is probably a good environment for that. Uh, it's, it's designed to be easy. It's designed to be uh, accessible to artists in particular. Um, and it's free. So if you just go to processing.org, um, you will have everything you need, including a ton of examples. Uh, and that's what I'm using to, to write the visualizations. In terms of learning curve, I've been programming my whole life. I started programming as a kid, uh, so so I can't really say how it would be for someone who has no experience in programming, but what I can say is I would encourage anyone who has uh, any desire to, to just jump in and, and see, um, see how inspired you get, because you might really be surprised. It's a very creative thing to do any programming. Um, and so, Michelle, uh, to get back to your <laughs> original question, uh, which I think was about the kind of long-term uh, effects of, of, of the present situation, um, one thing I just want to mention quickly is, uh, is I definitely think that moving forward, there are rehearsals, which in the past we would have done in person, uh, which will happen, at least that I'll definitely do over Jack Tripp. You know, if I'm playing a duo gig with Dana Stevens, for example, who's a great jazz saxophonist who lives in Patterson, New Jersey, it takes him like an hour and a half to drive uh, here. And I don't have a car, so it's, it'd, be, it'd be very hard for me to drive to him. Um, and we can just do it over over Jack Chip. Uh, so, so I think that's gonna, that's gonna be one change that happens in the future. And, and I just wanted to echo uh, a lot of the sen sentiments that the other panelists have expressed about essentially uh, constraints actually being the motivation for artistic innovation. You know, constraints are a gift. Uh, as long as they don't kill you, uh, they are what squeezes new things out of you that you never could have even have imagined before. And so they are, they are to be embraced and, um, you know, we've got to do what we can under the current circumstances and it's actually a very exciting time. Thank you, Dan. It really is an exciting time, but at the same time, you know, it's a, a little bit of a challenge for some. But I just want to say thank you for- Big challenge. A uh, wonderful panel today. Um, I, I think today's discussion was really enlightening for many of our audience. Um, I want to thank everyone behind the scenes who has helped uh, put this perspective series together. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our panelists, Theo Blackman, Todd Reynolds, Dan Tepfer, Jude Traxler, and Mike Perdue. Um, bye everyone. I'm Michelle Wright. I'm the Associate Director of Jazz Arts at Manhattan School of Music, and we really enjoyed our time with you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye -bye. Michelle. Bye-bye. Thank you.